Hi, my name is Moshe Kindler, and I'm the publisher of The Jewish Link. Hi, this is Elizabeth Kratz. I'm editor of The Jewish Link. And you're on The Jewish Link Pitch Meeting Podcast. So, Moshe, um, this week we have a guest who I I think you've known him longer, but I, he also entered my consciousness about 15 years ago. You're saying you grew up with this guy, but why don't you tell us a little bit about... <laughs> How you first met and how you first became aware of Rabbi well, Mark Wilds. Well, let me go back to what I just <laughs> said about, uh, about the, first of all, welcome Rabbi Mark Wilds. It is an honor and pleasure to be here. Thank Good. you for having me. Now, let's go back to the fact that we grew up together. We did not grow up together. Oh, okay. Rabbi Mark Wilds has no idea who I am. Ah. Okay. Well, that's not true. He does not. It's not true. But the truth is we grew up in, in Queens together. He's a Forest Hills boy. I was a Kew Garden Hills guy. And if you know that basically there's a, there's a park that separates... Kew Garden Hills and, and Forest Hills. It's a Flushing Meadow Park, or um, and you know, so there was a divide between the two communities. Ooh, okay? Like the tracks, is and it like the, the railroad? Track? And I don't think it exists today, but there was a sense of like, you know, you grew up in a Forest Hills that was maybe a little stronger. So it's a different community today. Um, Kew Garden Hills is still a strong community, but again, it has a different flavor today. And um, and, and everyone went to like basically only like two or three schools. So, so everyone kind of knew each other. We all went to the same camps. Um, it just wasn't as big. Um, and so I, I've known him longer than he knows me. Right. Okay. <laughs> and the truth is actually, I just want, I, I actually got to know him better only because I, when I was uh, many years ago from 98 to 2000, I was at Fifth Avenue Synagogue and I had the, the pleasure and privilege of spending many, many mornings with his father, Leon mm. Wilds. So, uh, yeah. so that nice. was that's actually where I got to. I actually got to know your father a lot better first. We spent a lot of time. My dad always, uh, you know, my dad was for over thirty-five years a professor of law at Cardoza, and he's just a mentor type. Always liked, you know, assistant rabbis take them out to lunch, try to be connected, help them out. You know, my dad's in a nice, easygoing balabayit. You know, um, he liked you very much when you were there. Yeah, so that's so. You're, so it's funny. Your father's a very, very dignified, very, very special person. Um, and yes, he he did take an interest in me. Um, I think I may have disappointed him, but that's okay. <laughs> he, he really wanted me to go to to stay in the rabbinate. Mm-hmm. I do remember him getting on my case about that. Hopefully, he'll forgive me. Um, that's funny. He didn't want me to go into the rabbinate <laughs> actually because I was his son. I think because he saw me. That's that could be. I'm just kidding. He's been very supportive. I, I, it's funny because your father's very understated, but he always loved to tell me, Elizabeth. His and we know this also from Michael, your, your brother. Uh, he was always very excited about some of his cl- some of the the clients that he had. Celebrity clients. Yoko Ono <laughs> was was someone who. Well, John. Just and, and John and Yoko, uh, John Lennon uh, was 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 uh, Wilds and Weinberg. You know his family firms. Uh, you know. Yeah, clients. I met him on my ninth birthday. John Lennon. Yeah, that's cool. He told me um, it was my birthday, so he said, "Happy birthday, Mark! You can have your dad back now." Oh. Because <laughs> for five years, it's all my father did. Wow. Basically, yeah. That's, that's for another conversation. Yeah, that's another conversation. <laughs> but, but let's get into... You're uh, like, mic drop. So, Rab- cool. so Rabbi <laughs> Wilds, as you know, in many ways, you're here because um, you built something really special. Um, I, I love... One of the things I love most about the, the paper is that I get to, we get to cover, we get to write about, we actually get to feature. Uh, we actually have you in the paper as a, as a Torah writer. Um, but at the same time, I, I look at you as a community builder. Okay, you've really built... A community at MJ, which uh, we we just said we were saying just before we started. You, what, Elizabeth, what was that phrase I, you said? I was going to say, if MJE didn't exist, it would have to be invented. Well, I, I appreciate you calling it a community because it's exactly what I set out to do. Um, we are in our own little orthodox bubble, and we have a very vibrant, beautiful community, whether you're in the more modern part of it or the more Haredi or somewhere in the middle. It's unbelievable how little of this exists outside of our world. There's literally no, almost no community left outside, at least for young Jewish people that are not affiliated. So, and I would say it's probably to this day, I love to believe people are coming because of my brilliant classes and books and writings, but they're coming for community. They're coming to belong. They're coming to, you know, be acknowledged, um, you know, to identify and to learn more about the Yiddishkeit, obviously, and to grow spiritually, but they want to matter to other people. And Manhattan can be a lonely place. Yeah, that's for sure. So one of the things that we've consciously been doing at the Jewish Link is leaning in to the experience of Manhattan, the Manhattan 
community member Mm -hmm. uh, because we started uh, covering Manhattan about two summers ago, I guess, when when uh, during the summer of COVID, when we expanded uh, into Manhattan and we realized consciously that the singles experience from an orthodox perspective can be very lonely and uh, isolating. And one of the things we did is we brought in a a friend, a longtime friend of mine from when I lived on the West Side, Judy Falk, right. uh, who started sort of separate from us entirely uh, during the same time period, the Upper West Side Shtetl, which is this great community that she's built, which is it's dissimilar to MJE, a totally different set of messages, but it's complementary mm-hmm. in a lot of ways yeah. too. Yeah. And Judy is, you know, very involved with at the Jewish Center, which is that where MJ still yeah, lives, yeah. still exists. Okay. We uh, we rent the two upper floors. Right. We've been there for okay. almost, an, I mean, our entire time, twenty five right. years now. Okay. Um, and it's it's nice. And the nice thing about people when they walk, when they're coming to MGE, they have to walk by and see the broader modern Orthodox community, mm. which at the Jewish Center is twofold: families, third floor, singles, first floor. <laughs> And as we say in French, Malin Bakodish, I always say, we go up in holiness, they come to 10 for MGE. Mm. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Although last job is the elevators, and maybe I shouldn't say this, but whatever, the, uh, there was a pipe, it's a 100-year-old building, the pipe bu- burst literally in the middle of my class. I hear gushing coming <gasps> through the elevator shaft, and I'm like, this is not good. <laughs> I, I, it was just kept going. So the elevator's been out, and the Jewish Center was kind enough to give us the main synagogue to do my minion because I have a, we have a sizable group every oh. Shabbos. They and, just moved out of the minion for you guys. They uh, well, they moved downstairs because they have some elderly people in their minion. Ours is all 20s, 30s. Um, but I was like, wow, we hit the big time. Ooh. Caesar's Palace, you know. Yeah. <laughs> you did, did your, did your uh, husband wear the hat? No, no, no. <laughs> we didn't do that. The, we, we the tuxedo? All the pomp and circumstance. Right. They don't still do that, do they? They do have do to wear On listen, Yom Tov? I mean, you, you didn't have to do this to Fifth Avenue. No. The, so the, at KJ, I used to wear a bowler every Friday night and a top hat Shabbat morning, and it was a a point of contention. The top hat, I remember, like on Yom Tov, maybe they they, they, they still, still wear, wear the top. They still wear the officers still wear wow. that. Right. Oh right. yeah. Oh, they don't play around. It's so old school. That's really. Yeah, I mean. Uh, it does fit the environment, though. It fits the surroundings. I don't think so. I, I think that even though I don't think so. I don't my my worst school. rabbinic faux pas was opening a sermon at KJ. I was assistant rabbi at KJ for Rabbi Luxstein for two years, from 96 to 98. And um, I took the hat, the top hat, and I made a, what I thought was a very cute joke, and then I popped it. It was Ooh. like one of those magician top hats. <laughs> <laughs> That's like the and I was waiting for like such a response. The place was packed with hundreds of people, crickets. Ooh. And I looked back, Rabbi Luxstein was sitting there, and I looked at him, and he's like, you just buried yourself, man. You know, <laughs> deal with, deal with it. It was nothing. It was no recovering. But anyway, yeah, it was bad. So you had to move all the way across town. Yeah, yeah but West Side's a little more chill. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, so, you're not only on the West Side, though. You, where else? You tell so me we else have um, we have an East Side base. Um, I started MGE with the West and East Side at the same time, which is Fifth Avenue mm-hmm. for for many years, and moved up town to KJ. So it's at KJ now. And our downtown is at Derrett L, which is on 29th between 3rd and Lex. We call it downtown. It's technically Murray Hill, mm. which, by the way, just interesting to note, has always been a sweet spot for our outreach. Um, I mean, there's some simple reasons for this, but this trajectory of young men and women, Jews, graduating college and moving into the city, so many of them move into Murray Hill. Yep. Right. There's buildings there with like, you know, pop up mm-hmm. another wall, three or four people in an apartment. It's a little more reasonably priced. So I, we've been there for 15 years. I started that about 10 years into it. But I started MG Simultaneous West and East. And Rabbi Roth, you should live and be well, was exceptionally kind and inviting to us at Fifth Avenue. Yep. Um, and the reason we were at the Jewish Center and the reason MG is still... MG and started MG was because of Rabbi J.J. Schachter, who's my mentor and teacher. He was the one who invited me in, in August of 98. And he was, like I like to say, my blocker for the first couple of years. Anytime I had an issue, Rabbi Schachter just used his incredible brilliance and clout to pave the way and establish us. Uh, So when people say, how did you come into existence, I, I give him my dad, George Rohr, and Rabbi J.J. Schachter. 
I would say, are the people who really helped me start this whole thing. Hmm. Wow. I have a lot of Hakar Satov to them. And you were mentioning before that this all started even before. You said you were doing this in, in the Forest Hills Jewish yeah. Center, which, which I don't remember as a Queens guy. So tell, tell me a little bit about that. So I, I was um, Queens Jewish Center. I grew up there. I loved Forest Hills. It's before the Bukharians came in, took mm-hmm. over. We liked the Bukharians, nothing bad with the Bukharians, but uh, it's a pretty thriving modern Orthodox community. My family was very involved in the shul. Yep. My grandfather, blessed memory, um, came from Germany, and he was on the search committee for Rabbi Grumblat, a blessed memory, who was there for so many years. And uh, I was in Smich and YU, but I was in Smich and YU, like a lot of people are, just to learn. I was on the, the law trajectory, and I had a pretty serious, definitive um, goal about getting a law degree. I was enrolled in a master's program, international affairs. I was going to save Soviet Jewry. I had this whole plan. Before they all got out, killed my career goals. Um, and I was in Smicha just to learn. I was very devoted to my Rebbe. should live me well, also Rebbe Parnas. And I just wanted to stay in his shear longer. And why you didn't let you do that. Yes. You got to be in a program. Yep. So, you know. So. Um, I am. Um, Mark, we tried the same ground. Tried, right. Yeah. By the way, my son this week just started Wayu Smicha, and he's in the same situation except with computer science. And they also don't let you float. You know, you got to be in a program. So I was in that, and I was going to just not get the Smicha because in order to get it, you have to do a Shemush, like an internship, apprenticeship. And I don't want to do That's for the people who really want to be rabbis. But somebody convinced me, and he's like, Mark, It'd be nice to have the degree hanging on the wall. <laughs> you put in three years. Just uh, figure out, do some internship. You could probably do something at the Queens Jewish Center. So at that point, you still were kind of planning to join the family bills business? Oh, yeah, or yeah 100%. Like, okay. So like in your 20s, before you... I was 22, 20, wow. 23. I was already in... Lo- well, yeah, went, I was already... You went to law school. Yeah, I went to law school. That's what oh. I thought. Okay, he's a, he is okay. a lawyer. He's a, he's a reform lawyer. Okay. <laughs> Recovering lawyer, right. Right. Hi, I'm Moshe Kindler. I'm the publisher of the Jewish Link and also a co-host of the Pitch Meeting podcast. And the truth is we need your help. We need your support. Uh, we don't need your support. The truth is we'd love for you to partner. If you like listening, if you like watching our our videos, our, our, our downloads, if you like watching our podcast or listening to our podcast, consider joining us as an advertiser or a, a partner. Uh, we have a lot of great ads and a lot of great advertisers in the weekly print paper, but we'd love for you to join us on the Pitch Meeting podcast as well. Thank you. I was in a joint program at Cardoza and Columbia. Okay. Columbia for international affairs, Cardoza for okay. law. And, I, and, um, and at the same time, I'm learning. I'm doing smicha in the mornings, basically. And um, this one teacher of mine said, just, just do it. Why don't you, you know, I was doing NCSY. I loved NCSY. I was with a band. I'm the drummer. I'm still, I still play the drums. And that's how I got gigs with NCSY. Mm-hmm. And I was dabbling a little in outreach, and somebody suggested call this Rabbi Effie Buchwald. He's running these beginner services. What? Yeah. The the Jewish what's it called? The National Jewish the Outreach National Program. Jewish. I was NJOP. Like, I, right. Yeah, I never heard of him. Mm-hmm. And uh, he'll set you up, and maybe you can do that at your shul. You don't even have to leave on the weekends. You know, I was single. I came home on Shabbos, and you can just run some outreach stuff in Queens. So I'm like, oh, okay. I was kind of interested in that. I called up Rabbi Buchwald. He sent me a videotape. <laughs> that <laughs> dates us a little, yeah. but yes. Betamax. Yeah. Nice. Okay? <laughs> I went to the fifth floor of the YU Library. It took me three hours to watch, and I was in love. I video. loved watching. He had like a mock beginner's minute, and he was explaining the tefillot, <laughs> and he was just like, I don't know. It was just really interesting. You were sold. I was, well, I wasn't, you know, I was like, I, I still hadn't dealt with any people. <laughs> so he then gave me a flyer to use. I asked my dad, I had no money. I asked my father if I could have a few bucks to take an ad in the Queen's Tribune. Ooh, and then around. I made, and, and I took the flyer and I plastered Yellowstone Boulevard, mm. Queen's Boulevard and 108th Street, all apartment buildings. I plastered it and I picked a date. And eight people showed up on a Saturday morning. I can tell you their names if you want. Wow. You didn't get a minion, though? Eight people, no. Okay. Well, it wasn't the halachic minion. minion. It was a beginner service, explanatory. And then I was in love. That, mer- that minion that, sold that me. That minion sold me. I was like, there's something here I'm really enjoying. I really love the exchange. People could just ask questions. 
um, you know, about what we were davening, what we were praying. I used, I remember, the, Mas- the Matsuda Siddur sure. with the Hebrew and the English side by side. And just an interesting group of people. They didn't have much of a background, so they were, but they were curious and they were interested. And then Rabbi Grimblad of Blessed Memory uh, would come in at the end and he would share some words of Torah. And then from that, I started a basic Judaism class, also co-sponsored with the National Jewish Outreach Program of Rabbi Buchwald. And every uh, eight weeks, I'd have Rabbi Grimblatt teach a class for the group. Uh, he would meet with some of my more difficult students. And when I say difficult, I mean intellectually challenging, because I was like a pisher. I didn't know what I was doing. And he was a brilliant scholar. You mean people with, with hard questions. I had, uh, I had a guy by the name of Vladimir Nyman, 30-year-old guy with a PhD from the University of Leningrad. Then in Forest Hills, you had Jews from oh, Russia, but wow. they were from Moscow and Leningrad, mm-hmm. and they were well-educated. Uh, they could care less about Yiddishkeit, but some of them you know, found their way in. And um, I didn't know what to do with this guy. It, it was like a press conference every Shabbos at mm-hmm. the Minyan. He would ask a question about science and religion, and I was wow. like, ah, I need to meet with this rabbi. Okay. I sat in, and I learned over the years, and um, I just loved it. And that's what I did that for three years. I then gave it over to someone else, Aaron Goldscheider, if you remember. Of course. So, Aaron, you, so you got your you got your Shemush credit though for that. I year. got my Shemush credit. I got Smicha as a result. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So then let's fast forward yeah. a little bit to you launched MJE yeah. Manhattan Jewish Experience, and what was your elevator speech at that time when you you know you, I know you went out and got a major donor and you got the space with Rabbi Schachter but like what was your goal at the beginning my, um, my it's a really good um my goal at the beginning was to see if I could pull out of the woodwork Jews that the other existing outreach organizations were not Asia Torah was very big already on the west side mm-hmm. Rebetzin Young Rice of blessed memory mm-hmm. was rocking and rolling I yeah. helped her get her space at KJ, because I was assistant rabbi at KJ. She had 12, 1,300 people every Tuesday night. It yeah, was, it was amazing. I went a couple times. Yeah, I mean, that was like the cat's meow in outreach at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, there were Rabbi Buchwald was a major force at Lincoln Square and uh, still a teacher of mine, and I was running a, a curriculum for him for his basic Judaism level two. Blah, blah, blah. I wanted to try my hand at it. Like you tried to seek out Jews who really had minimum to no identity yeah. at all and sort of start at the beginning. Yeah, right? I'm, uh, listen, Aish and Rebetzin Youngreis, Rabbi Buchold, were also seeking out those same Jews. Mm-hmm. But I felt like I was offering a different flavor. And I felt that, um, I mean, I'll tell you what it is specifically. Mm-hmm. I felt that um, there wasn't really... Uh, other than really Rabbi Buchwald, but what he was doing was really packaging programs. There wasn't, in my opinion, and there still isn't, other than us, a hands-on cure of program that is modern orthodox in orientation, in outlook, in hashkafa, in the way we approach outreach and Judaism in general. Um, Aish is great, and I'm friends with all the people at Aish. Chabad's unbelievable. I love them. I have, all my colleagues are in this world, and these are my buddies and my friends, but they're different, and there's a different hashkafa. I drank the Kool-Aid at YU. I actually believe in Torah Mada and religious Zionism and mm-hmm. more openness vis-a-vis women and, 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 and Torah education, and I felt that that, that wasn't being presented. Uh, most of Kirov tends to be more Haredi. It's Haredi light, so, it's, uh, so it can be effective, mm-hmm. but it's Haredi in its orientation, and it produces a certain type of Baal Shuva as a result. And I think also something that distinguishes your program is, I, and I got the sense from the few years that I was on the West Side and it happened in on a couple of your programs, there's sort of a sense that you guys are bringing people together, creating zivogim, mm-hmm. without throwing it in anyone's face. And I think you do have some, you do have a, probably some kind of impressive number of couples that have met and married through MJE. Three, I know 382, but who's counting? 382 people? Couples. Couples. Wow. That's a, that's a lot that's of That's amazing. That's a lot of 25 families. years. And I will tell you, I, if you asked me back in August 98 when I started this, my goal was not to create a couple. That was not part of the agenda. The agenda was to bring unaffiliated, less affiliated Jews in um, to classes, to programs, to dinners, social, educational events, and engage them in Jewish life, in Yiddishkeit. 
what I saw, what was happening on the ground, you know, we plan, you know, what's the expression? Uh, Man plans, God laughs. Thank you for filling (laughs) that in. Um, Was that people were meeting and like in serious numbers. And it might have been because I didn't set out to do it. Because when you do (laughs) set out to do something, it becomes a little too contrived. And the people you are looking to get don't want to be part of that. Right. And um, it's just a very natural, organic. We also do a lot of, you know, seminars and immersive kind of ski retreat every year in Vermont, spring retreat in the Berkshires, trips to Israel. You're, you know, why did people back in the olden days, I'm really going to date myself, meet in Grossinger's or in Camp Marasha? Right. They used to have T-shirts. I met in Grossinger's. I met because these were just organic. very, what's that? They were very organic. And it wasn't like a room with dim lighting and like cocktails. It was skiing. It was classes, but they were informal kind of NCSY Torah classes where people could, you know, seminar from way back, mm-hmm. where people could really... Now just, you, but you dated yourself with Now seminar. I dated so myself. Seminar is dated, yeah. So I was at the tail end of seminar. Okay. I literally got the last year. Richard Joel used to talk to me about seminar. Yeah. Precursor <laughs> to uh, all Kiro yeah. and seminar, yeah. So, so, like, so, so yeah. it's so amazing So to have had this result without setting out to achieve it it's it's well like now now serendipity it's serendipity but now we really try yeah i mean i'll tell you there was an incentive you guys know michael steinhardt sure yeah. so michael steinhardt i was able to engage philanthropically not simple years ago came to one of my shabbat dinners begged him to talk about anything other than god yes because he's a prof- professed atheist of yeah. course he started his speech off I don't believe in God, and you might be wondering why someone doesn't believe in God. I was like, oh, but he believes in the Jewish people. He believes in the Jewish people. Jewish people. Yeah. By the way, his wife, I was sitting next to, said, she leaned over and she's like, he does believe in God. He just likes to get a rise out of people. But whatever. <laughs> he, at the end of the speech, said that Rabbi Wilds told me, I asked him how many people met at MGE last year. And uh, I said it was a very particularly good year. We had 18. It was high. So he gets up. We had 300 people at the dinner. Um, after he caused about a third of the women to leave because he explained in about a 20-minute talk why we should reinstate polygamy as the only what? answer for Jewish continuity. Okay. That's oh the only God. answer for Jewish continuity is if we allow men, Jewish men, to marry more than one woman. So after, like, literally... By the way, Rabbi Benjamin... I'm, I'm going off. <laughs> Rabbi Benjamin Blech, Rabbi Benjamin Blech oh, was there he, that night. I'm very amazing. close with him. And he's amazing. on the west side. He sp- speaks for us all the time. Um, he comes over to me after Michael is done. And he's like, you must let me respond to that. <laughs> I was like, okay, now it's a circus. Oh, so good. And he did. Michael started on me, know a lot about how to make money, but he doesn't know the first thing about it. And he went into a whole thing about what the ideal in Judaism, and even if it allows it, it's not really what we're, you know... Whatever, going back to the couples, at the end of his speech, he turned to me. He says, how many people met last year? I said, 18. He says, I am prepared to make a substantial contribution (laughs) to the Manhattan Jewish experience if Mark and Jill, Jill's my wife, can pull off 19 this year. Okay. I worked very hard, and so did my wife. And every time a couple got engaged, I took a picture of them, and I sent it to him, to Michael. I said, 12, 13. And, and then we had an event where all 19 couples came. Oh, my God. And we had a big cocktails on the roof. We ran a program called the Mensch and the Medela. Don't ask. And we put literally a machitza with three women on one side and a guy on the other, or three guys on one side and a, and a, a woman, a single woman on the other. And Michael Steinhardt would like... It was like blind date? Yeah, that, some nonsense like a, we like did. Like a TV show. Yeah, we did a cute little like reality many years ago, and it kept him excited. Oh, my God. Um, but he, yeah, we hit nine. That was our biggest year. It was nineteen in in one year. Wow. Okay. So, so, that's so a little, what a little incentive will do. Oh yeah. Oh. But wait a second. You told me that it worked. It worked because you weren't trying. <laughs> You're saying you you, you became uh, a little siyata de I don't know. That was. I have to ask. You missed one thing. You you spent time as a former. One of my jokes is I'm a retired rabbi. So. You were a rabbi, and you really you constantly. You, did you have a bad reaction to to being in KJ to be the community rabbi? Did you just feel like it wasn't enough, or you just wanted I, to do something I mean, bigger? I can't say any. I had two rabbinic experiences before MJE, OZ and KJ. I worked for the two greatest rabbis, Rabbi Alan Schwartz, Rabbi Haskell Lukstein. I got tremendous mentorship and shemush from them, and I love both of the shuls, but I was just not 
down for the the rabbinate. And I, I used to look forward, you know, at the end of Musaf to take my top hat off at KJ and go up to George's George Rohr's beginner's minion. He used to invite me up to say like a little Dvar Torah at the end. And I just, it just, uh, I, I, I mean, there's two reasons. I'm just a little more of an informal, and I, I like that. Um, and I, I want to feel like I'm making a difference. And please, anyone who's listening to this, rabbis in regular synagogues are making a huge difference. Don't get me wrong. But I wanted to make a dent in intermarriage mm -hmm. and assimilation. Um, and I feel, and I'll say this because I, I, I feel very strongly about this, that the part of the Orthodox world that could be making the biggest dent in assimilation and intermarriage is doing the least. And I wanted to try my hand at it. And uh, I wanted to see if I could transform some of these shuls into outreach places too, like Rabbi Buchold was trying to do. Right. So I wanted to ask that question yeah. that I, that I want, said I wanted to ask before we started recording, which is that we have this critical mass and we've had even over the last month or two we've had multiple articles in the paper from we, this week we have a article from a volunteer shadchan a, a young a man uh, we've had judy falk who shared her perspective as an older single and what's going on and the ou has just come out with a study about the jewish single experience in ou affiliated mm -hmm. synagogues and none of us have, a, have had a chance to look at the study at all yet because it just came out i literally got an email about it this morning but like can we be involved can any person like i live in bergenfield can shuls in other places other than manhattan where there isn't as much of a critical mass of jewish singles yeah how can we help how oh. can we what what is it that we can do? Oh my gosh, I'm so excited to answer this question because, and I wish my wife was here because we're frustrated. Right. What ends up happening, both in terms of Kirov and Shadchanos, is that because there are so many unaffiliated or less affiliated Jews living in Manhattan, and because so many singles move to the city, it's then left to the handful of rabbis that live in the city to sort of fix these problems, when most of these people did not come from the city. Okay, and in the Orthodox community, they're coming from the five towns in Teaneck, and they're coming from everywhere else. Los Angeles, they're, they're, they're coming from all over the world, from South Africa and from England. And there isn't a concerted, organized effort to deal with the facts on the ground, the large numbers of less affiliated Jews and observant or non-observant singles living in Manhattan because it's all of a sudden... A Manhattan rabbi issue? Why? Because we happen to live there? The numbers are staggering. And there aren't as many, obviously, in Teaneck or in Englewood or else, because these are more suburban, family-oriented places. So the singles are going to gravitate to the city. I mean, that's how I met my wife. I was a single on the Upper West Side. And I have a lot of Hakar Satov to the West Side and this, what, this craziness, because that's how we met. And that's how a lot of people meet. And that's how I met my husband as well. There you go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But they're not a nearly enough hands on deck to deal with the problem. The rabbis are overwhelmed. There's, and most two, there's two problems. There's, there's two. There's the modern Orthodox young adults who, you, in theory, you don't really, that's not who you're, these are, these are people who grew up with 12 to 13 years right. of, 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 of education. Yeah. And in theory, like, yeah, we should be trying to keep them committed to the religious community, but that's not... Really those guys aren't right? showing up in the um, beginner's minion necessarily. Uh, I, I would say 10 to 15 percent of mm -hmm. my minion is that population mm -hmm. consistently, pretty consistently. I just had a meeting at the OU about this because they want to do something, as they should, as we all should, mm -hmm. because uh, we're losing a lot of our, you know. And you know, you know, you and I, when we went to college, you know, okay, if you got into Princeton, Harvard, and Yale, you probably went, and maybe you didn't go to, you know, to Queens or YU. Mm -hmm. But nobody went to Maryland or Binghamton or any of the Sunnis. Right. And now we are. Now there's JLIC on those campuses, which is great. But a lot of people are losing a lot of their Yiddishkeit, in my opinion, in, in those years, notwithstanding the great work that Chabad and JLIC does. And then they come back to the west side or the east side, which has become much more populated now with from singles, or Murray Hill. They're all over the city, and there's not enough people engaging them in Jewish life both from a Yiddish guy perspective and a, um, a Shadchanos, you know, matchmaking perspective. And they go hand in hand. Because if you're someone's Rebbe and they're single, mm -hmm. you're someone's teacher, you're their mentor, you're going to try to fix them up. And if you're not, you probably won't. If you're Rabbi Alan Schwartz 
or Rabbi Yossi Levine, who's my dear friend at the Jewish Center, you have a lot, you have hundreds of balabatim to worry about. And you can't fix up every single that passes through your doors. You don't even know who they are. There's 500 of them hanging out Friday nights at OZ and, you know, and Saturday morning and out there at the Young Israel. So Rabbi Gettinger, who's also a friend, he's the rabbi at the Young Israel now, he's going to set them all up. Like, you, you just, you need a team of people. So to answer, I'm sorry, I'm giving you a very long <laughs> No, it's, it's emphasizing the it, problem. It creates if the context. We, if we had, a, a, everybody should be assigned. Everybody should be assigned. You know, we should not have people out on their own. We should be taking care of each other. And maybe you don't need one person, but like, I always say this also, young couples who are getting married, they are, I, if we could institute something within the first 24 months of any Orthodox couple's marriage, that they once a month have to fix somebody up. It's like a tax, <laughs> okay? Because they're the ones who really know. Correct. You know, they're the ones, let, the, who do my, I have two boys who are single, right, who are, you know, who fixes them up? It's their friends who are married. <laughs> Correct. You know, if we could organize something like that, and, but it doesn't only have to be, you know, super young couples like that in their 20s. It could be in their 30s, in their 40s, if you do a little research and get on Jake, you know, uh, what is, why you connect or saw you at Sinai. And we need more hands on deck, in my opinion. And I think we need it for both the from kite issue, both of these issues, and the sh uh, the shidduch issue, and there's a, you know, there's an overlap there. But it's it's a it's a huge problem, and uh, I mean, I can't even tell you how many calls I get every week from families from the five towns from Teaneck, when I and when I'm scholar residents every Pesach and some other program, that's all I'm talking to these families about. My son, 12 years of day school, even a year in Israel, he's not so religious anymore, he moved down to the village. How can we get him involved in MJE? My daughter, she's 29, she's still single. You know, can you, I'm one guy, and I have a staff, but it's, it's, it's like they're, in, they're fully focused on secular Jews, unaffiliated Jews, conservative reform, living in the city. I don't have the bandwidth. So it's almost like you're saying that we need, a, we need an MJE for those, for that population, for the, you know, that's... Uh, yeah, we could work together. I'm not saying it has to be completely separate because we do get, as I said, 10 to 15% davening with us. Mm -hmm. I have a program called Fusion, which I started about seven, eight years ago, where I handpick a dozen religious singles from the neighborhood, some from the Heights, and I ask them to learn one-on-one -on -one with our students. We have a big one-on-one -on -one learning program every Wednesday night mm -hmm. about, like, 60, 60 chabrutos, it's a big program. So I need 60 tutors wow. to learn in that program. You know, 30 men, 30 women about. So I got groups coming from Stern, groups coming from YU. Um, but it would be better if it were the West Siders or the people a little older, because my chaver is 23 to 36. It's, they're not college, they're post-college. Mm -hmm. So I'll take anyone I can get. I have two boys in YU now, so they bring their friends. And they're good guys, but they're a little younger, and the Stern women are, you know, I have some, I have two women from Barnard now who are helping a girl from Columbia. I'll take anyone who's a decent role model and knows some Torah who can learn with somebody who wants. You get those people involved, that can also help deal with the problem. I think you can kill two birds here, which is if you engage modern Orthodox singles in the work we're doing, in reaching out, it's like they, they have to put on their best suit. Just think the last time you had to have somebody, a beginner to Judaism, over to your home for Shabbos. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, you're different. You're, 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 you're talking differently. You're speaking differently. Yeah, you you're tone, thinking more you about tone down the Lashon Hara a little. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you'll throw in even a Zemer. You know, did someone prepare Dvar Torah or something? We need something meaningful at this meal. we got to impress these people. You know, <laughs> <laughs> some families are better at it than others, but I, I, I do hear you on that. So that's a, that's a big part of our program, by the way. And that is we send, we have about 15 to 20 amazing families. Some from the Jewish Center, Modern Orthodox, some more Yeshivish, West End Avenue, that have been hosting for us for as long as we're around. Some of those same families are involved in matchmaking. Again, but it's a small number of people who happen to live in the city. How many families 
And those are the people who stayed. At, they got married on the west side, and they happened to own their apartment, or it was like yeah, their grandparents' apartment. Exactly. And they just have this palace. Well, it's, or <laughs> they they consider it a palace. Right. And it's like four bedrooms or something. Yeah, that's yeah. a palace. Yeah. That's a palace. They're they're very limited number, and they're, they're they limited seem to be number, less than there used to be. Is that and, right? Um, no, I think there's a sizable amount. Some okay. of them left during COVID. Right, okay. Some of them had a second home. Most of them had a second home somewhere yeah. in the summer for the summer. Just they had enough. Their kids camped. moved out. Right. Um, but but uh, most of them are still there. They have very special families, both yeah. the, 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 modern, the more modern ones and, and the, you know, when I came to the Jewish Center, I, I, um, I, I gave Rabbi Shachter the membership list of... And I said, please circle all the names that you think would be good to host our students. I did the same thing at OZ when I was nine blocks north. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I did the same thing at KJ. We do it now mm -hmm. because, you know, and Rabbi Riskin, my teacher, used to like to say, for the price of a chicken, you can save a Jew. And it's the greatest yeah. truism. Because yeah. the most sophisticated programming can never compete with a nice, normal family yeah. whose phones are not on who's having a regular conversation, looking at each other, eating good food, singing some songs, sharing a little Torah. It's a winner. It's the, it was a winner 30 years ago, and it's still the biggest winner today. Yeah, I remember that exactly. I remember that exact thing. I, I don't know if they're still doing it, but Charles and Yochev at Milo, are, mm -hmm. they, are they still doing it? Are you kidding? We send them oh. almost every shop. Seriously? Yeah, so, lovely I, So I was at their table. Lovely, and they lovely were, people. They're just Special. incredible. Yeah. And they're just mild mannered, regular balabatim. Yeah. You know, you know, so you know, nice. Like, oh. I think they invited me for Yom Tov. Like, they're like, where? They would call me, are you, are you yeah. going home for Yom Tov? Well, that's Tov the best thing, is once right. they have a relationship, right. we don't have to serve as the middleman anymore. Right. Oh, well, that's awesome. That's great. Yeah. yeah. But, but it's, um, I, I don't know. I argued this that we had a little thing in YU Action. Am I allowed to say YU Action? Jewish, is that like a Jewish Action? No, not YU. OU, OU, Jewish OU, Action. Jewish. The OU Jewish Action had a little hey, thing. I reviewed Rabbi Benjamin Blech's book in Jewish Action, uh, okay, just okay. so you know. Okay, so <laughs> Rabbi Schachter, my teacher, wrote an article in there about some study that came out that said that, that only like two-thirds of Orthodox Jews continue to identify as Orthodox after a certain age, mm. demonstrating we're losing like one-third so he says we have to put all of our eggs in that basket and you know and focus on in reach and not outreach. I remember that. So I called yeah. him up and I was like, Rebbe, what, what are you doing? You're, you're killing me here. You, you <laughs> put me out of business. Like you helped me start this thing. What do you mean? Big. He goes, Well, write something and let's get into a little of a fight online. <laughs> I said, I'm not fighting with you, you know, like Right. But, he's more he's a so, gadol. So, so yeah. he said he said, write a so one of the things that I wrote was I don't think it's an either or. I think if we would engage Orthodox Jews from a younger age in outreach, we wouldn't be seeing some of the issues we're seeing. Because my kids, every Shabbos, got to have a Shabbos meal with people who were choosing to be Jewish. And that's one of the great challenges uh, that all four of my kids went through when they went through adolescence. And they all went through very nice Yeshiva Day schools. Um, and like you know, serious ones, and they were pretty decent, serious kids. But they all went through, you know, whatever, rolling the eyes, this, you know. Yeah. But when they meet someone who's 25, who could be doing anything, and decided to, like, start keeping a little Shabbos, or whatever it is that they're introducing into their lives, it's like a little of a game changer for someone who's been religious their whole life, who was never really given a choice. Your kids grew up with that, though. So they, 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 they saw that. You're, you talked about those themes all the time with them. But why can't we do that with every family? No, it's, it's, that's such now, a really now, effective now and amazing point. Now, it's challenging in Teaneck if you don't have as many. But we could ship them in, and you could, we could figure out. Modern Orthodox people also know, through work and relatives, people who are not observant. Right? If you live in Great Neck or you live in, I don't know, the five towns, okay, you're surrounded primarily by other observant Jews. But we don't come into contact with, of course we do. In the Haredi world, it's less. I mean, that's changing now, too, as they're getting a little more out there. But, but um, I just think that we have what to offer. And when I bring every year, I do two Shabbatons, one usually in the five towns and one in Teaneck. And I bring, let's say, 30 to 40 MGEers to these neighborhoods. They're literally like little kids looking like, what is going on here? Right. I mean, to them, it's a shtetl. Right. Yeah. Now, the homes are beautiful. 
and and you know since I also do it somewhat for fundraising reasons, <laughs> we tend to go to the more significant homes, you know, and um, one of them was like, Rabbi, if I become Orthodox, do I get a home like this? <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> and the answer is yes. Of course. Know. All you have to do is keep, start keeping Torah and Shomer, and, and then Hashem just blesses you with you millions of dollars. You get engaged and Michael Steinhardt gives yes, you your minivan and you, know, you, so, you move to Teaneck. But, but um, it's unbelievably unique for them. Like, I don't think we realize right. mm-hmm. how unique the lives we live are. Today, yes. Uh, yeah, today for sure. But do you feel do you feel it's harder today to reach? What I hear from my Kira friends yeah. is, which I never really asked you this question, is it hard? It's Kira harder. Today? Yes, a hundred percent. Okay, I have to. I don't know what the exact number is, but to accomplish the same goal of twenty years ago, I have to do a lot more. Now I'm a little more savvy at it because I've been at it longer, so I know what not to do a little more than I did when I first started out. But people were easier. Not necessarily easier to draw in. We're still getting good numbers at our big Shabbat dinners and our events, cocktails on the roof. We're still bringing in, you know, 20,000, you know, um, attendees a year, which is about probably five to 6,000 unique visitors, okay? What's harder today is to really get into people's kishkas and souls. Why? People have, uh, people have more armor today? I, don't, I mean, I just, because people are still people. People are still people. A few things that have changed. First of all, people are much more distracted, and their patience and attention span is less. Okay. So you, so you just adjust, though. You have to adjust, but um, people want to feel something. Not minimizing it. I'm just saying. No, 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 no. Yeah. People want to feel stuff faster, and they lose patience quicker. People had a little more of a retention. You could keep people in the game longer for them to consider this kind of lifestyle. If you don't hop people quickly today, you don't get as much of a chance, in my opinion. That's A. B, I think the whole concept of objective morality has been destroyed uh, on college campus, primarily on college campus. Most people, when I started out in this business 20, 30 years ago, they were, people believed there was a right and a wrong. And you had to demonstrate, that was our job, that Judaism had that kind of claim on what is correct, what's appropriate, what's inappropriate, making a case for God and Torah and Hashemayim. And I still teach all that. And I'm writing a basic Judaism book now for, for Corin, and I'm putting all that in there because I think that's still important. But people don't necessarily believe anymore that there is an objective right or wrong. And that is really difficult because we're making all of these cases and they're like, you ever you see the way uh, interviews on like on like talk shows are being done? Mm-hmm. No one asks what anyone thinks anymore. They ask what you feel. Your feelings are now becoming reality. So if you feel something, that becomes a new kind of um, philosophy, if you will. So which is hard to refute. It's hard to get around. It's that's very to hard up. to get around that. So you have to then you you have to stum you have to like sort of approach people from a more emotional. Or, interestingly, Kabbalistic approach. Because Kabbalah and Hasidus is a little more of a seller today than it used to be. Two things sell eat more easily today than when I started. Kabbalah and Hasidus, because the language and the vocabulary of Kabbalah and Hasidut, which is a little more subjective, Mm -hmm. resonates more with young people than it used to. Uh, The language of, you know, pure rational argumentation. I'm not saying it's falling on deaf ears, but it's not as compelling. And I had a second thing, and I completely blanked. While you're thinking about it, so you become become a makubal, so to speak? I have, thanks to my oldest son, who's very into Kabbalah and Chassidus. He's a Rav Nachman kid. I think I knew that. Um, He, uh, I've been, I teach Tanya. I've been learning it for years now. And and just, you know, fine-tuning some of the Ramchal that I used to learn and bringing it into some other Kabbalah and Hasidus. Yeah, I love it, and, and people like it a lot. It's not for everyone, obviously. I'm, I'm going to guess 20 years ago, you never would have thought about teaching no. it. To, you know. Oh, I would have thought 20 years ago, I was like, got to hide this stuff from them. They're going to think this is so silly mm-hmm. and irrational. It's not the case anymore. Um, the, probably the most successful presenter of this, in my opinion, in our outreach world is David Aaron, Rabbi David Aaron, mm-hmm. who started Oraita. I've been very close with him. He just spoke to our group a couple of weeks ago on our trip to Israel. 
he's done a phenomenal job of packaging it in a way that can really be heard uh, today. Um, so I'm trying to do a lot of that. Um, the other thing that sells easier today than ever before, Shabbos, because mm. of technology. Yeah, People are so bombarded. Turn it off. Get I mean, it's away. unbelievable. Somebody said to me, he goes, Rabbi, I went on this conference with my company. They had this big black trunk. And before you went into all the sessions, you had to take your phone and dump it in the trunk. And some of the sessions lasted for a few hours. <laughs> I said, what was that like for you? And he was like, felt like a little like Shabbos, like what you're doing over here. Mm. I was like, oh, brilliant. You know, so all of a sudden we look really smart, you know, because we have a technology detox every week. And um, I think if we play that stuff up, um, you know, not to overdo it, but if you play it up, I think th those are ways of packaging uh, what is what, what is even more meaningful, I think, in the eyes of less affiliated Jews about Yiddishkeit today. Um, but it's harder. It's just harder. I'm not feeling it as much because I'm on I'm ground zero. I'm like on the front lines. I think the people who, in Kirov who are feeling it more are the yeshivas. Because the yesh to get somebody to go off and learn in yeshiva is a Herculean feat. And we've always been able to do it, but the numbers are less. I have any given year a few guys, a few girls, young men, women that are learning in yeshivas in Israel. One of my issues is that they're all a little more to the right also. And meaning, I love them. Meaning what age are they and they're in what their yeshiva 20s. do they go to? They're in their 20s. Uh, the popular ones today are Aish mm -hmm. still, Machon Yaakov, Machon Shlomo, Chappelle. uh, Chappelle's. Mm -hmm. That's basically, you know. You're the, actively trying to send, uh, you see, like if you have a success story, like they're spending six months, a year in Israel, if you can. If oh, you yeah, can. yeah. Because no matter what I do in Manhattan, I'm still limited in my ability to really, you know, hit somebody over the head in a very powerful way with Yiddish guy. There's nothing like yeshiva. And there's nothing like that full-time learning. Waking up in the morning and davening, eating something, going back to learning, it's, you know, it's a game changer for our community. It's no different for Balei Tshuva. Now, most of the people who've become observant over the years with MG have not gone to yeshiva. And, um, and we figured out a way of carving Jews without it. But it's not the same. And people will tell you, you know, um, my wife is a Balei Tshuva, and um, she went off to study and learn, but she was limited as to how long she could do it. And she, to this day, and we spent our first 10 summers of our marriage me learning in yeshiva and her learning. Uh, and, and always saying that if she could have just have had that full year, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> we're married 28 Still years. Still regretting it. You know, there's just, it's a game changer. For no, n no other reason than, than it works for our chavra. And so also bringing it home about the, um, changing the topic slightly, mm -hmm. about the married couples from MJE that live in Teaneck. Yeah. Um, I know some of them, they, they've all... Almost all of them have congregated at Keter Torah. If you, I didn't know if you knew that. Many of them. Many of them. And Not all you of have them. a, you have a. What time of the year do you have an? We MJ? do a Shabbat. I'm very close with Rabbi Shalom Baum, Baum. but I've also done uh, Shabbatons with uh, Rabbi Newberger, also with um, uh, at Beth Abraham, and also who, who made Aliyah. Rabbi Przansky. Yes. Oh, okay. He's Rabbi Przansky, by the way. Yeah. He's, he's, he's he made right, Aliyah. Yeah. We, so many of our he was, by the way, he, he was amazing. He used to teach for us all the he's time. He's great. Well, what's interesting about him, and I can see, is that, first of all, he's interesting, and he mm -hmm. speaks his mind. He speaks his mind, and I, we had issues. And we had issues. I personally didn't have any issues, but some of my students who are right, a little more on the left, who read some of his articles, were very put off. And, and uh, at some point, it, it became an issue for us. Um, that's the age we live in today. I didn't even discuss that as another issue. You know, sort of, we don't really get the hard left. Mm -hmm. The hard left is not coming so much. So I don't get like, but I'll tell you what, I, what I'm starting to get. like The light um, left, the weak left? Uh, well, most of our students are, are left of center mm -hmm. um, because they're 20s and 30s. And if you're not Orthodox and you're in your 20s and 30s, you're a liberal. Sharing your pronouns. You're the, yeah, but you might not be like, have lost your mind. You know, everybody thinks that, you you know, that there's a spectrum. And we, yep. so, um, but um, there were individuals that had issues with, you know, things that he wrote that he said uh, during the Me Too time. Um, yeah. And even though, 
I didn't really, in substance, disagree with anything he actually wrote. It's, it's, it, it, things have to be couched in a very, you know, um, oh, but I was saying about Israel. You know, the conservative movement, like 10 years ago, they had an article that JTS was considering not having their required year of learning in Israel, if you remember. Mm -hmm. And I was so upset. I was like, what are they giving up on Israel? How could they do that? And then for the first time this past summer, we have two groups that go to Israel, and the fellows <clears throat> who are learning with us every year, we named the program for Rabbi Lamb, Zekon Lavracha, because he was actually involved in it in the last few years of his life at the Jewish Center. And they saw on our itinerary, we're going to Shiloh. We're going to Hebron. Um, you know, and so I met with a couple of students, and they were like, I understand being afraid. We always had that issue. And I give them the, we use a bulletproof bus, we have a madrich with a gun, with a neshek, and uh, it shouldn't be a problem. But if you're still nervous, we understand you can just stay back at the hotel and go shopping. That's always happened. People are just nervous. I had a girl in the other trip this year, no ideological issues, but just didn't want to go. And we were already in the gush. We went to the winery, and we were going to go further, like to Chevron, and she didn't want to continue on. But for the first time, I, I had students who had issues with it, moral issues. Mm. How could you go? Isn't that Arab-controlled territory? Isn't that what we took back in 67? Isn't that contested area? I have friends who are Palestinians. You know, I told one woman, I was like, okay, I understand, as long as you don't think there is a moral issue, because I don't think there's one, and we could talk about it, um, just don't post it so your Palestinian colleague at work doesn't see it, so you, don't, you know, we don't get into a whole fight with her. But you should really be at least equipped and, and know that we wouldn't bring you to an area where there's a moral issue. Why would you have a moral issue going to Shiloh or to Hebron? I don't. And I don't consider myself a right winger at all. Um, I, I like to believe I, I, I have a perspective on both sides, but I, I come out on this side for this reason. And I gave her, a, sat with her and her mother for an hour and a half. Um, she still felt uncomfortable. She didn't come. And I respect it. I understand it, but it is, it's a shift. It's a shift. Now, having said that, I'll be the last person who will say that we need to take Israel off the outreach, you know, arsenal, mm -hmm. you know, as a quiver. And, and, you know, like Israel is still a game changer. The birthright trips, the, I'm not saying I love everything birthright does, but the, the, the concept of bringing people and turning them onto Yiddish guy by Israel is still working big time. Um, I think the follow-up, you know, is a big problem. Yeah. You were involved in some of the follow the birthright follow-up yeah. stuff. And MJ was involved, right? You were a host, I, tried. I think? I tried. They just, um, they have left it to anyone and anyone, everyone and anyone to do it. So, like, you know, when when you leave it like that, it just doesn't get done. So, and I, please don't misunderstand this. I, I love Birthright. I think the work they do is holy work. But uh, I just feel like for $120 million annual budget, they should be doing some follow-up, or at least engaging us to do so. And I've fr been very frustrated for many years, been able. I can't get the lists. I can't get the this. It just doesn't happen. Um, <laughs> and it's a shame because it is the most ambitious outreach initiative of the 20, 21st century. Especially with the Israeli government partner, yeah, it's it's, it's the unbelievable. Biggest, yeah. It's the biggest. It brings the it hits the most amount of people, but um, and I and there are people I know who come to MJE, you know, who are Bali Truva today, and their spark was birthright, so they have to be given a lot of credit, but it it's, just it's, I, it requires this uh, buy-in from the participant, and then they have to sh actually show up somewhere actually meet they're, someone they're, like you or find a rabbi but they're, they're or so a... they're so nervous right they're so nervous that if they attach any strings people are going to stop coming mm. and i think we are we are not believing enough in our target audience they're getting a free 10-day trip to israel you can ask them to do something afterwards you know to come to a few kind of things afterwards or um and i understand the nervousness mm -hmm. and then who do you give it to and do they get a monopoly on it? You know, JEC used to do had a, had a, had that years ago. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Well, so what else can we do together? Let's let's bring it all. Let's tie this. I mean, all in up terms in of the nice shadchanis, the I would just love to see more hands on lay 
uh, involvement in both outreach and shadchanas. There are so many sad, lonely singles, not only on the Upper West Side, but wherever they may happen to live, and they're not being paid attention to. Actually, Rabbi, one of the people who wrote in the last few weeks did not want to be characterized as sad or lonely. They oh. wanted to be, um, yeah. of be treated as, as they should be, like a full and active member of a community and not half a person because they are not married. 100%. I mean, I'm not implying that we should, our attitude towards them should be like they're a nebuch. Um, they're not Nebuch. They're just as wonderful as anyone else. They just happen not to be married. And the biggest leaders in my community are all single. I, 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 and the right. Jewish Center is very proud. They had a, a single. They had a single guy who was their president, and um, in the shul. And they're trying to show that. There's no question. But we need to realize that if you really want to do a chesed, you want to help someone not stay alone. And um, in order to really make a difference, we just we need more hands on there. We need more people thinking about this specific person. And then when the date didn't work out or they try, there's no reason people should be going months and months without having a date. That, that's what's going on. And, um, you know, and it happens in all walks of life. It doesn't just happen in, amongst Orthodox singles. It also happens with my students as well. And there's only so much we can do. The paid professionals, there's only a few of us doing this. So I would love more help. I, I had a long meeting at the OU about doing some of this with them. Uh, to whatever degree you guys can be part of this, um, I think it would be wonderful. And I still think it's the greatest way to turn Jews on to Yiddishkeit is to expose them to our beautiful community. I don't think we realize, I'll say it again, how wonderful we have, uh, a wonderful of a setup we have. Just, you know, families, with all of our problems and our issues and, and problems and people going off the derech and, yeah, still, Afal Pekin, this doesn't exist anywhere else. Uh, wow, okay. First of all, <laughs> I, I'm, just, I'm just, my head's actually spinning because I realize how much is on your shoulders, how much, you know, how much is on your plate. Yeah. Uh, you, I, I, you're actually, in many ways, I feel like... I feel, feel bad like, for me. Feel, you want to yeah. write it, you should write a check. <laughs> I, I'm not. A, I'm not a donor. Really, I'm get you like five more staff members. But my, my point is, like, it's you need yeah. fifteen more staff members. Yeah. You need. Uh, I mean, like, it's all. And, and there's no program that solves this. It's all people. It's relationships. There's no way. I always said that. That's why you know they say for the price of a chick. Like, it's just engaging people. Um, and there's only so much any one given community member can do. But if we elevated the members of our community, and I really think it would, it would grow us, it would help us, it would give us more meaning and purpose, because we have the best, I don't mean to pat my, the best chevra comes to our events. I mean, I could keep you here for hours with amazing stories of like smart, intelligent, modest, fine people just happen not to be observant. They just happen to grow up in a reform, conservative, or unaffiliated home, and and, and they're just great, and they're off the radar. Nobody, we don't know they exist. They're just going to work in the city or wherever they live. You know, a lot of them you know, live in Queens or Brooklyn because Manhattan is so expensive now. Jersey, by the way, Jersey. Hack, Jersey. Hackensack and Fort Lee, by the way, I was oh, going to tell you. Fort Lee, I'm getting a good number from Fort Lee. I'm waiting for you to, to start something in North Jersey, seriously. I would love to. I wanted to do something in Hoboken because there's tons of young mm -hmm. people. And Hoboken. They yep. take the path and come across Jersey City. Yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I know. I'm, I'm waiting there. for also, we're waiting for a Hackensack. Has, I'm saying all these communities are all, all future growth territories yeah. for you. So. Yeah. I guess I'm going to leave off with a bracha. Uh, yeah. we're, 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 we're a few I'll weeks before it. Rosh Hashanah, you know, and I just, I just want to say that uh, I really, I just, uh, I hope that when we speak again in a few years, that you will feel that you have been able to keep making a dent you know you said you started wanting to make a dent uh, we see you made i mean i think i think in the paper we see you made a dent and let's hope that that dent grows uh, oh, continues sure. over you. the Thank next you. i really uh, appreciate year. it and by the way i wanted to give a plug i don't know when this is coming out but um we're um i have this 40-day challenge oh right, oh, right. we forgot the book to <laughs> uh, uh I don't know if you I have, have it, it in my house, not in my office. Anymore. I have it in my car. Oh. Okay, whatever. <laughs> 40 day challenge. We know 40 day yet. challenge. We love it. Yeah, yeah, you could show a thing of whatever okay. it is, mm. but um, I have over 2,000 people doing it this year. Oh. 
Oh. Oh. Yeah. You just published it a year ago. So. I published it three years no, ago. No, sorry, two years ago. Two, yeah, but yeah, I have on the recording, mm-hmm. I have 2,000 people now on WhatsApp groups doing this, and I have a whole bunch of different people doing little classes based on it. Because it's just like tid, you know, um, bite-sized 40-day pieces of Torah that everyone can study for five, six minutes mm-hmm. a day, move on with your day, and then have something to help us prepare for Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur. Because we're all expecting this magic to descend upon us on the high holidays, but as we all know, if you don't, you know, Rav Salvechik said famously, you know, in uh, Kedusha Bali Hachana, that there can be no sanctity, no holiness without any kind of, that's the era of Shabbos, right? Shabbos is not Shabbos without doing what we have to do before Shabbos, so that's the 40-day challenge. Little great. plug, shameless plug. No, it's okay. great. <laughs> shameless really plug allowed. Enjoyed, really enjoyed reading that, and it, it really did advance some of the ideas that I, that just, you know, bungle around in my head, you know, before the Yom Tovim starts. You coming out with another book? Are we going to do 80 days, 365? Um, <laughs> what are we doing but next? But the, the Beginner's Guide, the Corin. A Corin the Corin thing is a very big project. It's taken me forever. Because oh. it's like these massive topics. God, mm-hmm. Shabbat, <laughs> Chesed. You know, so it's like, but it's, uh, the first part is going to be ready soon. So. Amazing. Great. Thanks for being with us. We have a Thank lot of you. admiration, I think, so, uh, for what you're doing, and I think we've we've left this conversation feeling that you're very, very understaffed. <laughs> Thanks for being with us on the Jewish Link Pitch Meeting podcast. If you would like to participate or be in touch with us in any way, please email us at editor at jewishlink.news. And follow us and find our podcasts wherever you find podcasts.